One of my favorite psalms throughout my whole Christian life has been Psalm 139. I grew up reading and even memorizing it in the King James Version. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. I found this both comforting and fearful. God knows me, good and ill. But the emphasis of the psalm is surely comfort. God's presence is meant to calm our fears, to bid our sorrows cease. That's why I love this psalm and why I think I especially loved it during my adolescence when I was trying to figure out my place in the world. But there are several key words in Psalm 139 that either puzzled me in the King James or I now know misled me, not because the King James translators made any mistakes, not because I'm a dummy and or adult, but because language has changed in the last 400 plus years. I wanna talk through this Psalm, Psalm 139, noting all the dead words and false friends. Dead words are words we know we don't know. And I'm gonna tell you right now, there aren't any in Psalm 139. Unperfect in verse 16 is a word we don't use, but its meaning is obvious from its parts. Compassist in verse three, we wouldn't say, but it was so close to encompassed that I got the meaning. There are, however, four words or so that because of language change don't mean to us quite what they meant to the Elizabethans, or at least they're worth talking about. Some of them are misleading to modern readers, and I'm here to explain them. I call words like this false friends. And I'm gonna tell you right now, there's only really one very clear false friend in Psalm 139, but there are some other words that might cause confusion for various reasons, including language change, especially one or two of them. I just wanna talk through this precious piece of God's word. Let's jump right in. I'll make a few comments on every bit of the Psalm, stopping to explain the false friends and confusing words. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Let's talk about wonderful. I'm not going to put this on my official false friends list for what it's worth because I think people still get the gist and the contemporary meaning is super close to the meaning that the word had in 1611 in the King James in a context like this one. Modern translations actually still use the word wonderful here, but to my ear, it's just a quarter tone off proper English pitch. <laughs> The word appears also later in, in the same psalm. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In both cases, I think the more proper word to choose in our English would be wondrous. What indeed is the difference between wonderful and wondrous? That's hard to say with absolute specificity. Words aren't things that you can measure with spectrometers and dole out in kilograms. The dictionary definitions aren't very different from one another for these two words, wondrous and wonderful. But look at the example sentences for wonderful in my contemporary dictionary. They all think she's wonderful. And the climate was wonderful all the year round. Wonderful used to mean, I take it, in the King James Day, evoking wonder and awe. But this often happens to word. It has happened to awesome. Some of the meaning has been leached out through long use. Now it just means very good. I don't think the climate in Hawaii evokes awe. I don't think your college-age niece, whom everyone thinks is wonderful, evokes awe. But I think David was saying that his knowledge of God's omnipresence does evoke precisely that, awe. I'll admit straight up, multiple modern translations still use the word wonderful here. I already said that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I wasn't misled as a child by this word. I picked up the right shade of meaning from context. But I also don't think it's an accident that the CSB, the newest translation that I tend to use regularly, did use the word wondrous. And this is why. God's omnipresence and his construction of our bodies are both wondrous things. They evoke awe. I'm in awe, standing here thinking about it, as I think David's thoughts after him. Onward. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. We don't say wither very often, but I know I had no trouble understanding this as a child and teenager reading my King James. It was a little confusing to me that the King James translators chose the word hell. I wondered, I remember this, when in the world David would make his bed in hell. 
but I took it as hyperbole and moved on. You know, God would be everywhere. I now know that the Hebrew word here is Sheol, and that the word meant more and not less than hell. That is, it could be used to refer to the grave, for example. Jacob said in Genesis 44, 29, and if ye take this also from me and mischief befall him, that is Benjamin, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. And that's translating Sheol. The King James translators knew not to translate this word as hell here. Jacob's theology could be a bit shaky at points in his life, but he fundamentally did not believe he was going to hell. I'm sure of this. I, I personally think that David meant by this word Sheol in Psalm 139 what Jacob meant by it, and that grave would probably have been a better choice. The King James translators used it elsewhere. But it's not a false friend, and I'm not saying the King James translators did wrong. I just had to note that briefly because it confused me as a child, but I will move on because it's not related to changes in English over time. Exactly. It's not a false friend. Onward through Psalm 139. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. That word cover is interesting. It just kind of jumped out at me while I was preparing this video. It occurs in the next line too in Psalm 139, though it translates a different Hebrew word there. For thou hast possessed my reins. We'll talk about that in a bit. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. There's that word cover again. When David said, the darkness shall cover me, he used a rare word whose most famous appearance is actually in Genesis 3.15 of all places. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The word seems to mean bruise or even crush. That's the word that's being translated here in Psalm 139 as cover. That's the sense in which David speaks of darkness covering him. It's smothering him. It's crushing him. And yet, because of the Lord's presence, it's not. Even the night becomes light around God's people. What a great and memorable phrase in King James English. Even the night shall be light. I just love the rhythm there. A small note about me, light about me means light around me. That's a usage of about that I think is still found in British English. It's these phrases that make King James English indelible in my own mind and heart. I mold them over like the man of Psalm 1, day and night for decades. But thou hast covered me in my mother's womb was and is obscure to me. It said something about protection to me as a kid reading this psalm. But the modern versions almost all take this verse differently. Listen to this version. For you formed my inward parts, not possess my reins, which we'll talk about in a bit again. You knitted me together, not covered me, in my mother's womb. That's the same verse in the ESV. The Hebrew word translated covered me can mean that elsewhere, and it does in the Old Testament, but it has another sense that fits better here, and I'm honestly not sure why the King James translators appear to have missed it. I'm willing to entertain the hypothesis, though I'd have to do more work to confirm it, that they did commit an error here. Again, I'm not sure. I have great respect for the King James translators, and they may have had reasons that I just haven't been able to discern yet at this point in my study. It is a rare word, the Hebrew word is, and the King James translators acknowledge in their preface that rare Hebrew words can be difficult to define with confidence. But both times it's used, it's used also in Job, it speaks of the bones and sinews, and it seems to mean knit or woven. That's what David is saying here. You wove me together in my mother's womb. That word reigns, I said, I said we'd talk about it. That is, of course, an older word. Maybe you could call it a false friend. Maybe not. It's an older word for kidneys. We still speak of renal failure, and that's the failure of the reins, the kidneys. I honestly can't remember if I understood this as a child. I have a memory of perhaps thinking it meant that God was like a driver and I a horse and he held the reins, but I'm not sure if I'm making this up or pulling it out of thin air or somebody else's memory. I do feel that surely other people must have grown up thinking this. If you did, I would love to hear about it in the comments. I am not adding this word reigns to my official list of false friends until I have more evidence that it actually did mislead people here and at other places where it was used. I tend to think it's just a dead word. Onward. 
I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We talked about that. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. <laughs> Love that phrase. There's wonderful again, and you could say similar things about marvelous. Now marvelous means great, and it's often used sarcastically. The last pump is taken at the Costco gas station, and I have to be somewhere in 10 minutes. Marvelous. But of course, here it means causing someone to marvel. Onward. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. This is beautiful language, and there are several English and Hebrew complexities in it that are worth exploring. My substance, for example, was not hid from thee. Substance, that's actually the Hebrew word bones. And the OED reveals that substance could occasionally indeed be used to refer to bones. Here's the sense. Originally flesh, especially as that which is lost in a larger gaping wound. And later use also muscle and occasionally also bone as providing strength to the body, especially in a horse or dog. The King James translators have a note saying that this word, this Hebrew word, could also be translated strength or body. So this appears to me to be then what they were thinking. I'm having a little trouble piecing it together. I'd welcome your thoughts in the comments. I certainly had trouble piecing this together as a kid. The meaning was very obscure to me. I just chalked it up to the poetic nature of the psalm. But given the context, I do tend to like what most modern translations do here, leaving it as something concrete and physical, not as a metaphor like the King James does. David's been talking about the formation of his physical body in his mother's physical womb. This is a key text used by pro-lifers, such as myself. I think that's a fine use of it. I think David is doing more of that here. In any case, I don't think this is a false friend, but reading multiple translations can shed light on the King James translator's choice here, even if it was a good one, as I genuinely assume that it was. But I've actually come now to the word that got me started looking at Psalm 139, the word curiously. My substance, David writes, as translated by the King James, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. I do believe I had a little trouble with this as a kid. It seemed to mean secretly, maybe, or was I just getting that from the previous phrase? I, I just wouldn't use curiously in a setting like this. But I do know the word, and I can sort of get some meaning out of it. Curiously in our English means in a strange or unusual way, like the sentence is curiously worded or curiously I find snooker riveting. I got that from my dictionary. God, in other words, has his odd ways of doing things. For example, David was made underground, curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. That's how I took this phrase. Little did I know that I was being tripped up by a false friend which is now officially number 70 on my list of 50 false friends in the King James Version. Look at other uses of curious in the King James and you'll start to figure it out, I bet. There are, for example, repeated references to the curious girdle of the ephod. That precise phrase occurs eight times in the King James. And we're already closer to a solution to what the word curious means in Psalm 139 because curiously wrought and curious girdle share something in common, intricate workmanship. This becomes even more obvious in some of the other uses of the word curious in the King James, such as Exodus 35, 32, where Moses says that God has gifted Bezalel to devise curious works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass. Bezalel wasn't making strange works. God did not tell the Israelites to make a weird or unusual girdle of the ephod. No, the OED, Oxford English Dictionary, reveals that the word curious used to have this sense, ingenious, skillful, clever, expert, a sense the OED now calls obsolete. You can kind of see how the older senses of curious gave us our current sense. Ingenious, skillful, clever, expert is a short step to desirous of seeing or knowing, eager to learn, inquisitive. But the word has made a clear and definite shift in meaning over time. And that's why I misunderstood it when I read Psalm 139 as a child. We just can't assume that even good readers, and I was a good reader, I have to say. I started reading at age four. We can't assume that even good readers will think to check all the other uses of a given word, like curious, when they come across an odd usage of it. And in fact, a false friend is a false friend because the current sense in our English works. I thought the King James was saying that God used unusual means to shape David as an unborn baby. 
I wasn't incredibly far off, but I did misunderstand. And there's no need for that misunderstanding. Modern versions use skillfully or intricately in Psalm 139 when trying to communicate the same idea. And let's remember, they are communicating the same idea as the King James. They have to use a different word to do it, however, because curiously just doesn't have the same set of senses in our English today. Curious in Psalm 139 is a false friend. But still, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God! Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men! For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I certainly memorized those last couple verses. Actually, many of those phrases have stuck with me throughout time. God knew when he ordained the Reformation that many Bible translations would be produced. He knew, too, that all the languages into which those translations were made would change over time. All languages do change in his good providence. He knew, God knew, that people would misunderstand sometimes. He knew about false friends. And sometimes I struggle with this. If God knew all this, why didn't he give us some instructions to forestall this circumstance? Why not inspire just one verse telling us to make translations and telling us how to make them and telling us how often to make them? That would kill a lot of online conflict right there. Other people struggle with the justice of childhood cancer, earthquakes that kill 20,000 people, and the doctrine of election. Because of my particular bent and what I believe to be my calling, I struggle over the justice of God in making language change happen, but not explaining it, making it so it's difficult for most people to really understand. I'm being honest here with my laments, and I take them to the Lord before I take them to you. I've done this many, many times. I've prayed to him. And I'm comforted by God's presence in Psalm 139. Before these thoughts were on my tongue, he knew them. Before I got up to make this video, he was here. His hand is on me. That doesn't mean all I do is right, all I say is right, but it does mean that when I hit difficult questions and laments, I'm also hit with a command. Trust God. God's enemies speak against him wickedly, but his children get to take their complaints to him too. They just get to go away, we get to go away, reassured that God knows best. And I believe this, how precious are God's thoughts to me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and refine me and evaluate me. Know and then purify my thoughts. If there is any wicked way in me, and I'm sure it's there, prune it and lead me all the way to the everlasting life that is in Jesus. Lead me to the time when all my questions about your ways will be answered in whatever way you see fit. Lead me to the time when I will know you even as also I am known by you. Amen.